Hey, this is round four of the Grace Place version of Name That Tune. Uh, after tomorrow night at Christmas Eve, this show is canceled, okay? So I've uh, only got today and tomorrow, and it's just kind of a, a fun way of get us thinking about uh, what, we, what we really know about songs that we sing. So we play a Name That Tune with a non-church song to lead us into talking about what we know about some church Christmas songs. And uh, we've had some uh, volunteer contestants, kind of volunteer contestants, kind of the Army way of volunteering. Hey, you, come here and do this. And uh, I'm really glad that uh, Jenny and John have volunteered to uh, come up this morning and be our contestants. So come on up, guys. The shepherds, come on up here. Come right up here and take your place here. Nice round of applause from the studio audience. And who gets the mic here today? He does. Jenny does, okay? So, because you're going to love the prize, Jenny, and, and you don't want to disqualify them from the prize. I know we've given away some, some really junky prizes uh, so far, but this is serious today. We've got a good prize we're going to give away. And uh, the, the uh, instructions for you in the audience are what? Be quiet. Don't say the answer if you know it before they do. Don't, don't disqualify them from the prize by, uh, by blurting out the answer. What I'm going to do is give you some hints first. Listen to all the hints, and then I'll give you one guess at the end of the hints. If you don't get it then, then we'll play a few notes of the song and see if you can get it then, okay? And we actually had in the last service the guy guessed without hearing the music and got it right, okay? So, the, the, you know, the, it is possible to do that. So this song that you're going to, uh, that, that you're trying to guess today uh, was first recorded in July of 1952, okay? Uh, just a year or so before John was born, right? Yeah. Just, just kidding, John. Uh, just a year or two before I was born. Uh, by December of that year, it became number one on the Billboard charts. Uh, you will not go a Christmas season without hearing this song. It, it's, we went to dinner last night after church and heard it in the restaurant. I mean, it's played every year. It's a really famous song. The way this song came about was uh, the big department store, Saks Fifth, Fifth Avenue in New York City. Uh, they, they actually commissioned the song. In other words, they paid somebody to write it as a promotion for their annual store Christmas card. Okay. Uh, the song was first recorded by a 13-year-old boy by the name of Jimmy Boyd. But since then, uh, dozens of other people have recorded this song. Uh, you, you probably have some CDs by Homer and Jethro who recorded this song at one point. How about the Ronettes? The Ronettes, a household name there. Uh, Bobby Sherman. Are you old enough to remember Bobby Sherman? Anybody here remember Bobby Sherman? I'm kind of ashamed to say that I remember Bobby Sherman. Uh, the Jackson Five recorded this song. Yeah, they record everything. Uh, from the country world, uh, Reba McIntyre recorded it. John Cougar Mellencamp recorded this song. And probably John's favorite singer in the whole wide world, Tiny Tim, recorded this song. Do you remember Tiny Tim? Do you remember what, what was the famous song he sang? Can you sing a couple of notes of that? No? <laughs> Like tiptoe through, yeah, something like that, right? If you don't, if you young people don't know who Tiny Tim is, you really don't Google him. It'll warp your mind, okay? I mean, just don't. Let let well enough alone, and, and just your life is better off for not having known who Tiny Tim is. But that's not that's not part of it. Those are the hints. Can you guess the name of the song without hearing the music? Oh, we get. We got we got a supporter in the audience. Can you guess? I don't know. You want to hear some music? Uh, okay. White Christmas. I'm just going to. Nope, play. nope. That's not it. That's not it. Chad, play a few notes for him. Oh come on. <laughs> that's not the beginning of the song. That's in the middle. Help them out, Chad. Can, can you can you name that tune? I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. Gosh, I was worried you were going to get that. <laughs> how, how many of you knew it before the before the, everybody? 
Everybody's saying, oh, they're not going to get it. Yeah, that's I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus, which uh, by itself is kind of a weird song. Uh, you know, in fact, just in, uh, interesting trivia about the song when it first came out in 1952, it was a uh, considered a racy song. Because, you know, kissing and Christmas and all that, you know. So racy that in Boston, the Archbishop of the Catholic Church in Boston uh, condemned the song and banned Catholics from listening to it. Serious. And 13-year-old and, and little Jimmy Boyd had to go meet with the Archbishop of Boston and explain the song to him, and then he lifted the ban. Okay? So y'all want to sing a few notes of that song? Let, 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 let me let you hear the original version with Jimmy Boyd. That's all I can stand to that. I'm telling you that. How that became a hit, taste in music have obviously changed over the years. But that's 13-year-old Jimmy Boyd. Now, we do have a prize for you. I mean, I'll, I'll take the mic because you're just going to want to grab this prize and run with it. Okay? Uh, you, in this red bag, hey, John, you probably won't care for it much, but uh, Jenny, you probably would love a shiny new red pair of shoes. Yeah, the, these are some Italian guy that sells shoes for ridiculous prices, Gianni Bini or something like that. You recognize these, Joyce? You recognize these? Let me tell you why they're up here. I'm walking, I'm walking through the kitchen in the church this week, and I walk by the lost and found box, and guess what's in it? Shoes that I paid big money for, I figured... If she doesn't care any more about them than that, I'll just give them away. <laughs> so do you, do you want the shoes? You know, I, what I don't understand, did anybody else bring a spare pair of shoes with them today? What do you do? Do you, do you have a spare in your purse and you just change? And do you go home barefoot? Yes. There's always an excuse. I'm sorry I can't give you the shoes, okay? But I, I do have a, a, a prize for you. And uh, in, in good cold weather, there's nothing that tastes better than a scoop of ice cream from Milky Moose Ice Cream. So go enjoy that. And uh, thank you for playing Name That Tune. Now, Joyce, you can have your shoes back on Christmas morning because I'm going to wrap them as a present for you. Okay? So, hey... The reason we're having fun with this is not to show off what we know or in the case of the shepherds don't know about non-church Christmas songs, uh, but it's just to get us thinking about the same thing with church Christmas songs. What do we know about them? We sing them. I know that I could tell by the way you sang that almost everybody in here knew all three of the, the uh, old favorite Christmas songs we sang today, but did you know what you were saying when you sang those songs? Did you realize how much Bible you were singing when you sang those Christmas songs. Because one of them we sang today is probably one of the most biblical of all of our old favorite Christmas songs, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Uh, it's been around since the uh, 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 1730s when a famous American hymn writer, Charles Wesley, wrote that song. If you, if you get an, a, a hymnal, uh, we don't have any here, but if you get a, a, a church hymnal sometime and thumb through there and look at how many songs Charles Wesley wrote. He was a prolific songwriter. And he had a famous brother named John Wesley, who was a, a pastor and a preacher. And together, the Wesley brothers, John and Charles Wesley, founded the Methodist Church in America. Uh, the, the song that we sing is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. It, it's not exactly the same words that Charles Wesley wrote and not exactly the same tune because Charles Wesley wrote some of his songs in really old English. And even by 1739, when he wrote Hark the Herald Angels Sing, uh, some of the meanings of some of those words had changed, and so people were uh, not connecting with it because they didn't understand the words. So about 15 years after he wrote it, uh, another guy in America changed the words and updated the language. Well, it lasted that way for 100 years until the mid-1850s, and then somebody changed the tune. They replaced the original tune that Charles Wesley wrote with another tune. So we don't sing the same song, 
with the same words and same tune, but we love the song, Hark the Herald, the Angels Sing. And it has so much Bible in it. It's almost like Charles Wesley either had so much scripture memorized or he wrote that song with the Bible open so that he could just pour God's word into that song. I want you to look up here at the screen. I just quickly went through Hark the Herald, Angels Sing. And, and all of that came directly from the song. It talks about all those things. And you can see there's an exact biblical reference. There's a verse, chapter and verse, where that's found in the Bible. I challenge you sometime, print off the words to the song and go through it. I, I bet you you can find more than I did. But there are two other things that I found because that's too much for us to cover. So like we've done every, every week in this series at uh, Christmas time, I picked out two others that we're going to look at in a little more detail. So you need a Bible. You need to go in your Bible to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to look at the first of the two biblical truths from the song that I want us to see, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. If you didn't bring your Bible, there, uh, somewhere near you, under the chair in front of you, is a, one of our Bibles from the church, a little black hardcover Bible. If you use one of those, it's page 819. And we're looking for 2 Corinthians 5.18. What we're going to do is we'll read the scripture, then we'll look at the song, and we'll see what they agree about. 2 Corinthians 5.18, our Bible's page 8.19. In verse 18, it says, all, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. There's a word that's used three times in there that is a, it's a great word, still around in English today. We don't use it a lot, but it's the word reconcile. The song and the scripture both agree that, that it's about being re reconciled to God. We saw the scripture. Look at the first verse of the song. Look at the highlighted part. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. I often wonder if when Charles Wesley wrote this song, did he have 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 open before him? Because they are in complete agreement that one of the reasons that, that the baby Jesus came was so that we could be reconciled with God. Uh, we don't use the word a lot, but in the scripture... The definition of reconcile means to be brought into a close relationship. It means to be brought into favor. It's, it's like no matter, no matter how much I did wrong at home this week, I'm brought back into favor because I rescued the shoes, okay? There's a reconciliation going on. We see that's what it means in the scripture in a larger sense. There is distance between you and God without Jesus Christ. And the only thing that can close the distance is Jesus. What puts the distance there? The Bible says sin separates us from God. See, these old Christmas songs, they, they, go, they go to our sin. They go to our need for Christ. They never leave the baby in a manger if it's a song worth singing in church. And the Bible says sin puts distance between you and God. Sin means that you are not in God's favor. And the only thing to restore closeness to God and put you into a favored relationship with God is the reconciliation that Jesus offers. And you can't understand reconciliation until you take that baby from the manger and take him through the resurrection and understand that you need to trust him. There may be people in this room who are distant from God right now. You've never trusted Jesus Christ. Not that you're a bad person. I mean, you're here in church. You may even believe in God. You may be a good family member. You may be a good person. But what the scripture says, that until you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you ask Jesus to come into your heart, there is a distance between you and God. And furthermore, that distance means that, that you, are, you are totally accountable for your sins all by yourself. You're responsible. You're accountable. If you die that way, you will pay for your own sins. But there is a way for your sins not to be held against you. Verse 19 says it's a part of this reconciliation. It says that God 
not counting men's sins against them. If you want somebody else to take responsibility for your sins, Jesus said, I will take it. I've already paid for your sins on the cross. I, I, will, I will take the responsibility and you can be wiped clean and brought into a close favored relationship with God, but you gotta, you gotta take that baby 33 years past the manger to the risen, crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ and you've gotta invite him into your life. Some of you haven't done that here today and here it is Christmas time and we're singing about God and sinners reconciled. Do we know what we're singing? I wonder if anybody in this room, when we sang that song, I wonder if we realized, hey, that's talking about me. You know, I'm a sinner and I've been reconciled with God because I've trusted Christ. There's so much Bible truth in these songs. And I hope that as we sing them in the future, we, we, look, we look beyond just the fond memories of, of growing up singing these songs and we look at the scriptural truth that's in them. There's one more piece of scripture that I want us com to compare to the song, and you've got to go to another little book in the New Testament, a little further into the Bible, the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 9. Colossians is a little book, four or five books further into the Bible than 2 Corinthians, page 834 if you're using our Bibles. Colossians, chapter 2, verse 9. page 834, one little verse, but I'm telling you, this verse captures one of the deepest truths in all of Scripture. And what we're going to see is that the song relates to this truth. Colossians 2, 9, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Listen to that again. In Christ, in other words, in, in this baby Jesus who came and lived 33 years on this earth, in him is all the fullness of God in bodily form. And what that means is that Jesus is God. There's God the Father and there's God the Son who came to earth. Look at the, the second verse of the song. See if it agrees that it's about God's incarnation in Jesus. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. We don't use the word incarnate very much, but, but it's a great word that means God the Father became God the Son, Jesus. And he did it, he did it to, to live amongst us as, as one of us, to walk amongst us to, so that we could see who God is person to person. We could see how God wants us to live and we could be led to the point of reconciliation. But he did it all without giving up his deity. He was also still God at the same time. One of the deepest truths in all of Scripture. And it's about the incarnation of, of, of God in Jesus. And a lot of people believe in, 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 in something that I consider really stupid called reincarnation. That's when you've already been to earth and, and you're here now as a person and next time you're coming back as a grasshopper or a, you know, a chimpanzee or, you know, a lot of people believe in that, but when you talk to people about incarnation, you see, God had never been to earth in human form. So it's not reincarnation, it's just incarnation. And he came. And he came to bring us reconciliation, closeness, and favor with God. Now you stop and think about this. This is an amazing thing that God the Father would give up the glory and the splendor and the majesty of heaven and come down here and be born where animals lived and be laid in a feed trough for his first bed and, and never own any property and walk the dusty roads of Jerusalem and be scorned and rejected and be killed for us. All to bring us reconciliation, closeness and favor with God. You know, I, I have a simple mind. And I look for simple ways to understand important truths. And I, I'll never forget, I read a story many, many years ago that Billy Graham, the famous uh, preacher and evangelist, told uh, uh, explaining the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. And, and it's always helped me kind of understand it. 
Uh, he tells a story about a father who just he took a walk one day with his four or five year old son, and they were just walking around, beautiful day, pointing out you know different uh, birds and squirrels and, and just enjoying a, a leisurely walk. And they came upon an ant hill, and the little boy was curious about what it was, and the dad explained to him that's where ants live, and uh, that that's like a house for ants. It's like a bunch of ants got together and they built that house and they lived there. And the little boy, okay, well, that makes sense. That's an ant house. I get it. And so they walked along a bit further and uh, the little boy accidentally did what, what, what we sometimes do. He scuffed an ant hill. You, everybody knows what happens when you do that. The ants go crazy. You know, their house has been destroyed. The world is upside down. If ants can be distraught, they're distraught and they're running around like crazy. And it upset the little boy because he just understood that an anthill was a, a house for ants. And now he had destroyed their house. And so he said, Dad, I want to help them fix it. I mean, I, I, I want to help them fix it. And the dad, no, you, you know, you can't do that. Well, Dad, I want to help. I want to do something. And the dad said, you know, you're, you're too big to help them. He said, son, the, the only way, and it, you know, and it, could never happen, but if by some miracle you could become an ant for a little while and you could change from who you are now into an ant and you could go down there and live with them, then you could help them. But the way you are now, you're too big. You're too much for them. You know, that's a simple story that has always helped me understand the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. God the Father is too much for us. God the Father could not walk and live on earth as one of us. Too much for us. Too big, too powerful. And so what did God do? He said, I'll become one of them for a while. I'll become an ant. And I'll go down there and I will be one. I will fit in and I can talk to them in their language on their level. I can walk with them. I can show them who I am in person. I can show them how I want them to be. And, and I will die and take the punishment for their sin and I will rise again with the power to grant them everlasting life and all they have to do is accept my reconciliation offer. I don't know about you, that's the best deal I've ever been given. Such a deal as that, that my God would come down here and live as me for a while. All to say, hey, Thrasher, I want to be close to you. I want, I want to reconcile with you. Your sin has put distance between me and you. And I'd like to close the gap. I'd like for you to be favored. Right now you're living life on your own. I found that to be a very good deal many years ago. I wonder if there's anybody here today who's distant from God. See, what you're doing is you're not finding red shoes to buy your way into somebody's good favor. You're finding the red blood of Jesus to cover your sins and to bring you close to God. Why, why is that not a good deal for you? And, and if you know that you're distant from God, you, I mean, you know it in your heart because God's Holy Spirit is telling you. If that's you this morning, why, why don't you let God close the gap today and, and bring you into his favor? Right now where you sit, you can just quietly say, Lord, I, I get it now. God and sinners reconciled means me. And I want to be reconciled with you today. I want to be close to you today. I want to leave this, leave this place different than when I came in. No distance between me and you, favored in your sight. You just tell him, God, I believe Jesus did it for me, and I'm asking you to forgive me and come into my life. You can do that right now. 